So I know a lot of you are probably already kind of uh, familiar with what cryptocurrency is, but if some of you aren't, that's okay. Um, feel free to ask. Does anybody not know what cryptocurrency or bitcoins or any of its clones are? Okay. So basically, I wanted to go over um, real quick. A lot of different states are trying to um, come up with all kinds of random regulations to try to control money laundering, things like that. And it's, it's basically doing a lot more harm than good. Um, and it's kind of trying to undermine, un undermine the whole um, idea behind cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, basically, this is like the overview. Um, so basically, there are some federal regulations that apply, uh, state regulations. Um, and some of these state regulations end up um, causing, well, they, they all tend to cause more problems um, than they solve. So we'll start with um, federal regulations. So basically, um, the IRS qua uh, basically considers Bitcoin, for example, it's very, very volatile. Its value goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, it's solely based on supply and demand. Um, with no central bank, no nothing to kind of intervene and kind of control the value to a certain degree. Um, so the only way they could figure out how to tax it is let's consider it an asset. Um, so it's basically personal property um, for tax purposes. But anyways, um, if you want to basically exchange Bitcoin um, to other people, things like that, you need to follow a whole bunch of steps, um, at least on the federal level, depending, you know, there's also other state stuff. Um, but on the federal level, basically, um, you need to keep track of who your customers are, names, uh, if they're doing electronic payments online to receive the Bitcoins from you, you need to store a copy of their ID for up to five years, which is very, very bad. Because, <laughs> I mean, no matter how, how much you secure your computer, uh, if somebody gets a hold of it and they have, you know, all your customers' IDs, that's a huge risk. Um, and you would be technically liable for that. But you're, you're required to keep copies of all that um, for up to five years. So that's, that's a big problem. Um, another flaw with that is once you do the exchange, um, they can send the Bitcoins anywhere anyways and then there's no way to really know where it went so i mean it's kind of like you're storing all this personal information on your customers for no reason because it's very difficult to trace anyways um and then obviously we all know what money laundering is um criminals use it all the time um to hide money they might set up um you know a front corporation or company or something in order to basically funnel their illicit funds through. Um, so the government's trying to stop that on the federal level because um, they're concerned that cryptocurrencies make it easier. But instead, it just puts legit, like legitimate consumers at risk because now all these people have to have scans of the driver's license, everything stored, um, which shouldn't be the case. Um, so on the state level, um, basically we have um, New York State was really the first one to kind of try to regulate uh, Bitcoin. It was a disaster. They called it the Bit License. Um, again, they were claiming to protect consumers, trying to um, prevent money laundering, yada yada. Um, so basically. <coughs> The initial upfront cost for the um, application itself, okay, I don't have a cursor, but it's um, $5,000 upfront to apply, um, which for a startup doesn't seem too, too bad because um, you can make a return pretty quick. But the problem is in order you know, um, to make sure you're in full compliance with New York state law um, and you do everything by the book, 
it can cost upwards of $50,000 in legal advice. So that pretty much takes anybody, like the average Joe, right out of the equation. Unless you have a large amount of capital to start with, you're not doing anything with um, exchanging Bitcoin. Uh, whoops. So, um, so what ended up happening is most of the major exchanges in New York State simply moved to other states. It was cheaper for them to actually just pack up and leave and go to a nearby state um, than to deal with all this. So one, all these companies darted it anyways. Um, so it really, the regulations didn't help and um, it actually hurt the economy in, in New York State um, to a degree. Um, New Hampshire actually came up with a very controversial way of trying to um, regulate Bitcoin as well, that basically, um, basically if you want to exchange Bitcoin for other people uh, for fiat currencies, you have to have a money transmitter license. They just passed this like last year. Um, I don't know the exact value, uh, what it costs to have a surety bond offhand, um, but the, the value of the bond is 100000 The amount is less than that. Uh, but there's, it's just, it makes it near impossible for anybody to, again, unless you have a lot of capital to start up front, you, you're not doing anything with Bitcoin. Um, as a result, there's actually a bill, um, House Bill 436, that's being considered um, right now um, out of, you know, uh, from people from, um, I believe it's the Free State Movement, um, was a big, po uh, big part of the push for that um, in New Hampshire to basically make Bitcoin exempt from the money transmitter license, basically undoing what they just did. Um, because they're afraid it's going to hurt the economy because all these, like here in Massachusetts, it's a gray area. So there's no real licensing, there's no nothing. So what do you think all these businesses are going to do that are, you know, they can't afford a money transmitter license, they're going to go south of the border. So that's bad for the New Hampshire economy. Um, and then... This is basically a graph here. Um, all the gray states are basically states, kind of a weird color scheme. I don't know why I borrowed this offline, but don't really know why they um, chose the grayish color for the unfriendly states. <laughs> if you ask me, like Massachusetts is a gray area state, they probably should have used a different color scheme. I just kind of borrowed it. but. Um, you know, basically any of the orange states are kind of like, there's no real regulations, you can kind of do what you want, um, nothing's official on the books yet. And then the red states are, uh, the red states are pretty much a no-go. Um, so basically, I just wanted to go over, because a lot of people here you know, probably use cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or Dogecoin, whatever you use. Um, because a lot of people don't realize that these regulations are actually being put into place um, kind of on the sly. Um, stuff's being passed here and there, and it's actually, it's not helping, it's making things worse. Um, and it creates things like gray markets where, um, now it might actually enable things like money laundering because now people are going to set up fronts in other states and we don't want to get into that because that is a front for like a black market and it's it's just bad news um you know there are tons of legitimate uses for cryptocurrencies i mean even microsoft for a while i don't know if they're still accepting it but they accept it on their website or at least they did for a while uh, a lot of other legitimate businesses uh honor it because they can, they can flip it um, and make some money that way. Um, anybody have any quick questions or comments? Go for it. Yeah, we had a bill in the state house last year to just to accept Bitcoin for fees, fines, taxes, just, just for the state. Really? Yeah, and uh, obviously I voted for it. I didn't hear about that. Uh, 
but it was it was very simple. There was uh, a lot of these gray haired guys from their eighties who don't understand the internet and whatnot. Right, right. And they thought that the state was going to be holding on to Bitcoin. We said no, there's a surety bond on this. So the state would never handle Bitcoin. This is just to you know poor people would pay their fees and fines and whatnot by using their, their Bitcoin account. The state would just get Right. Just exchange it for the fiat. So most of them just didn't understand it. I mean, we, we tend to think, oh, it's corruption and a lot of it's dark and whatnot. And there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of yeah, you know, there's... self-serving crookedness in politics. Yeah. But in this case, they didn't accept it, even though it would have been in the state's best interest, it would have been in everyone's best interest to accept it. Yeah. Because you just couldn't explain it to these people. Yeah, and... The other thing is, you know, the media kind of portrays, oh no, you know, Bitcoin, it's linked to cybercrime, that's what criminals use, blah, 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 blah. You could argue the same thing, you know, say anybody who walks around with cash is probably up to no good. Like, it's the same mentality. Well, you get what I'm saying. Um, a lot of people, well, maybe that wasn't the best example because a lot of people don't walk... Okay, a lot of people don't walk around with cash that much anymore, but um, but you get the point. Um, it's, it's the like, same argument. It's like the red jacket rule. They had a, when the gang members were wearing red, they would outlaw red, so the gang members would change to a shade of burgundy or something like that. Yeah. It just be just far enough and up so they would say, okay, now anyone wearing burgundy is committing crimes. Not that yeah. specific example, but I mean... Yeah, I get the idea. So Yeah. Like marijuana's probably the best, best one. So they outlaw marijuana. Right. I mean, certainly, yeah, do some criminals use Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. But they also use cash. So are we going to ban cash because some bad people choose to use it? Because it's hard to track? It just doesn't make any sense. Anybody else have any questions? or No? Okay. <laughs> oh, I had one more. Sure. Do you have any ideas for legislation you'd like to get to In relation to this? Well, I'd like to see House Bill 436 go through, which would make Bitcoin at least, which is the most prominent cryptocurrency, exempt from the money transmitter license. Um, but another thing is on the federal level, um, people shouldn't have to keep track of, you know, storing customer information, you know, scans of their IDs and stuff for up to five years. That's, that's a huge security risk. You shouldn't. That's ridiculous. Hi, I'm Paul Paradise. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I came here partly because I grew up in Boston and um, I attended Boston Latin School and graduated from Brookline High School. In fact, my father was a music teacher. He taught uh, the string instruments, and um, as many, I never told anyone this before, but he taught Michael Dukakis' kids how to play the violin. So, in, in fact, I sent Michael Dukakis an email once. He remembered my father. So, as an interesting anecdote, I'm staying in a bed and breakfast in Cambridge, and uh, also staying there is someone from England. So, he, I told him I was going to be speaking at the pirate party, uh, pirate con. He got very excited because he was familiar with the, the Pirate Party in his native country. And he also happened to work for Pfizer, so he was very familiar with the topic um, of, of, of my talk today. Um, so this is an article. Uh, I'm a journalist. Um, this is an article that's going to be published in Men's Health next year. And the title of it is called The World's Most Counterfeited Prescription Drug. So I kind of gave it away because the person I was talking with is from Pfizer. The drug is Viagra. And uh, just as a short s a summary of it, uh, most of the counterfeiting occurs on the internet. And it's really more of a social problem. Uh, most of the people who buy it are otherwise intelligent men. And they don't dream of who they're sending their, their credit card information to. I mean, it's certainly not Pfizer that they're sending this to. It's either an organization in another country uh, it could be a terrorist organization. It could be supporting another criminal organization, or it could be a rogue scientist. And they have no idea, in fact, what they're getting back. 
Now, in some instances, it's true, you will get Viagra back, but in many instances, you may be getting an inert substance, you may be getting something that's an antibiotic, you may be getting something that's tinted with blue ink. So uh, to do this article, I traveled to Groton, Connecticut to see, uh, which is a big research facility for uh, Pfizer. And uh, they have no problem determining whether that it's counterfeit, but determining what in fact it is is a whole other matter. Because if they ever do catch the people who are involved in this, they would have to show some kind of evidence of what it was that was being sent around. So uh, again, this is an article that will be uh, published in Men's Health, which is a pretty big publisher. It has over a million in circulation uh, sometime next year. So I'm going to read portions of the article. And I also discuss a thing called uh, what's known herbal Viagra, which is uh, sold just about everywhere. And it's a whole other th thing. So anyways. So while researching the article, I traveled to Pfizer's research facility in Groton, Connecticut, and met with their research staff, which spends over 90% of its time investigating counterfeit Viagra. Other problems involve expired drugs that have been reintroduced into the system, cancer drugs that are medically worthless, drugs that have been uplabeled. Now this involves repackaging the drugs, so if the original label says 30 milligrams, then a fraudulent label is placed saying 90 milligrams with a significant charge up in cost. As far as Viagra, enhanced sex certainly explains the demand, but this is really a complex and dangerous social problem. Guys would never dream of taking counterfeit cancer medications or driving a car with counterfeit brake pads, either ignore or are unaware of the risks. Most choose a website after conducting a Google search or after receiving an email spam solicitation. So most of the uh, Viagra is, ordered, come, is delivered through the mail. Now, mail order pharmacies have been around since the 1800s, but the number of mail order pharmacies jumped into the hundreds of thousands when the World Wide Web became mainstream in the late 1990s. Viagra.com was launched in 1998, and Viagra was available through the website at about the same time and later through a home delivery service after Pfizer partnered with CVS Pharmacy in 2013. Another early website was drugstore.com, launched in 1999. The website partnered with Rite Aid a few months later. Uh, over the years, internet has assisted hundreds of thousands of consumers to safely order prescription medicines at a discount, but the downside, again, is a staggering number of rogue mail order websites. A man who visits one is likely to be taken in by his professional appearance, often enhanced by a background picture of a doctor and medical supplies. Ordering is easy, usually all that is required is filling out a form and the online pharmacy will write the prescription or fill the order without one an invoice paid with a credit card and delivery as quick as the next day. Who could ask for more? The FDA has investigated and seized many websites that register the domain with the name of a trusted source like a pharmacy in a bid for legitimacy. The discounted prices are enticing, much less than the actual price of the legitimate drug. Many use the, use the word Canada. It's no secret that Americans have been traveling to Canada for years for lower priced drugs, even though this violates the FDA's personal importation policy which prohibits most drugs from being brought into the United States from another country, even if the prescription was written by a U.S. doctor. Canadian pharmacies began online marketing in 2000. Legitimate Canadian websites are listed under the Canadian International Pharmacy Association's website, www.cipa.com. Consumers generally won't be prosecuted for purchasing ED drugs online or bringing them over the border, especially if it's a small quantity for personal use. Now, the Food and Drug Association investigation found that half of all ED drugs purchased online were fake. That gives online buyers a roughly 50-50 chance of getting the genuine product. However, some of the fakes analyzed contained dangerous substances like paint, ink, or sheetrock, while others contained different medications like antibiotics. Another study put the ratio at 77%, leaving buyers with a less than one in four chance of getting actual ED drugs. According to Special Agent Daniel Burke, Senior Operations Manager of the FDA Cybercrimes Investigations Unit, there are 40,000 to 60,000 domain names that can be tied to illegal pharmacies at any given time. Part of the problem is that people do so much day-to-day -day business on the internet. The 15 million consumers who enrolled in the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, did so through the internet. Most physicians today order prescriptions for the patients electronically. An FDA survey found that of the one in four adults who had purchased prescriptions of drugs online, only a third had any idea of how to do so safely. Now, the director of Pfizer's global security team in North America is a man named Brian Donnelly. 
according to him, the uh, internet problem, he likened it to the spokes of a wheel with each spoke branching out from another country. At the top level is the lab, often in India, that's making the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Next comes the tablet or capsule manufacturing site, and then distribution, often from China, India, and Pakistan. According to Donnelly, the bottom rung is the internet affiliate level, which is the computer server in one country. Once the order is placed on an affiliate website, it's shifted to a course site in another country that's often a large operation dealing in counterfeit medicines. When the order is processed, it's sent to payment processing in another country, which may also be processing payments for child pornography and other illicit operations. The customer in the United States will ultimately get his Viagra from a drop shipper in the United States. This is the result of a bulk shipment sent from overseas that wasn't seized. Those that don't get through are chalked up as a cost of doing business. Counterfeit drugs have a long history dating back to traveling salesmen hawking snake oil. Pills are an ideal product to pirate because usually the only way to detect the product is, a, is as fake is through physical and chemical analysis. Some of today's counterfeits are so good it takes a team of scientists and rigorous testing to prove the counterfeits are fake. This is crucial to building a criminal case. Pfizer's global security team for North America, as I said, is located in Groton, Connecticut. Interestingly enough, most of the major drug firms in this highly competitive pharmaceutical field have their own security operations that not only analyze fake pills, but have a reciprocal arrangement amongst one another to share information. Uh, Brian Donnelly uh, was a formerly an FBI agent for 20 years, and he has a PhD in pharmacology and toxicologies. Donnelly's counterpart at Eli Lilly also worked for the FBI. Donnelly is in charge of a forensic team of scientists that receive samples from members of the public and law enforcement and customs each week. The samples include Viagra and any other drugs that Pfizer manufactures, including Lipitor for cholesterol, Lycra for pain, and Celebrex for arthritis, and so-called herbal Viagra, which do not require a prescription and often contains sildenafil citrate, or Tadafil, the active pharmaceutical agreement in Cialis. Pfizer's team receives investigations from three sources. One is from, so, from calls to Pfizer's complaint center. Often these are from consumers who have purchased Viagra over the internet. They will be sent, if you complain, they will be sent a priority mail order pouch with instructions to send it to Groton for analysis. The second is from private investigators who pr pursue leads from the street, internet, Craigslist, social media, and other sources. Often they will try to meet with the counterfeiters and use other strategies to gain intelligence. The third is from law enforcement, for example, Homeland Security, Customs, and Police in the United States and other countries. 95% of the products analyzed at the Croton Laboratory are either Viagra and herbal Viagra, says Amy Callanan, senior scientist on the forensics team, which documents every step taken in the scientific analysis. Determining the pill as counterfeit is the first step. Determining the pill's composition and where it came from, if possible, are very important. It's a fascinating cat and mouse game because the counterfeits look identical and in some senses are even better in, in terms of visual than the genuine Pfizer product. Callan and her staff have found legitimate Pfizer products that are expired but are relabeled. Drugs used in experiments that are repackaged. Sadly, cancer and antibiotic medicines have been sent for analysis that tend to be medically worthless. Every step in the analysis is rigidly documented, beginning with cataloging the weight and size and taking a digital photograph. After that comes the use of a bevy of state-of-the-art technologies from a videometer that uses spectral imaging to test the ink used in the packaging to a handheld Raymond spectrometer used for measuring the wavelength that makes up the pill's chemical signature, and the use of infrared spectroscopy, which involves sending an infrared beam to interact with a small sample that determines its composition. Other, other technologies used are powder X-ray diffraction, high-pressure liquid chromatography, and mass spectrometry. Much of the demand for Viagra can be attributed to the drug's meteoric rise to blockbuster status, sometimes called the little blue pill, Pfizer launched Viagra in 1998. The first oral medication for ED, Viagra quickly became a blockbuster drug and a cultural phenomenon. Sedanofol citrate, the active ingredient of Viagra, was originally developed as a cardiovascular drug to treat angina, chest pain caused by arthrosclerosis or blockage of the coronary arteries from fatty deposits. The benefits of Sedanofol were apparent when the test patients were reluctant to return the drug at the conclusion of the clinical trial. Instead of causing blood to rush to the heart, the drug allowed for increased blood flow in penile tissue, causing an intense erection. Viagra actually changed the way society looked at male impotence, which was once a taboo subject and thought to be primarily psychological. 
Rectile dysfunction, on the other hand, was a rarely used term until Pfizer paired it with Viagra. ED was used to describe various degrees of sexual performance and as a problem affecting tens of millions of men. The cause was largely organic and treatable with Viagra. Viagra benefited from the FDA's legalizing direct-to-consumer advertising shortly before the drug's launch. DDT, DTC allowed Viagra to go mainstream with television advertising. The first pitch man was presidential candidate Bob Dole, who had surgery for prostate cancer. The market of potential users widened after Dole was replaced by more virile males like NFL Hall of Fame player and coach Mike Ditka, who told viewers, viewers to stay in the game. Another advertisement had 37-year-old baseball player Rafael Palmero. Many advertisements cleverly took advantage of FDA's fair balance rule, which requires pharmaceutical companies to list the drug's limitations and hazards in DTC advertisements. The commercials amount to a male fantasy and began with a young, attractive woman entering into a frank discussion about ED and concluding with a health warning to, quote unquote, see a doctor for an erection lasting more than four hours. So, juxtaposing an attractive woman with a warning about an out of control erection was almost too good to be true and seemingly offered sound advice. ED is something a man doesn't want when you're about to have sex with an attractive woman. No problem, take a pill. Everyone was talking about Viagra, from late night talk shows to an episode of Sex in the City. Modern communication in the media informed men around the world about the new miracle drug. Doctors report overwhelming demand and writing prescriptions around the clock for Viagra, which may have contributed to a masculinity crisis similar to the pressure put on athletes who use athletic enhancement drugs for maximum importance. Now, according to Maika Lowy, author of The Rise of Viagra, Viagra raised the bar even higher in terms of sexual poor performance. This may also inhibit men from asking their doctors about erectile dysfunction, whereas the internet allows for a sense of anonymity. ED drugs are supposed to be taken under a doctor's supervision. Misuse of the drug can have disastrous consequences. For example, Daniel Medford, 35 years old, took 35 Viagra pills during a two-day drinking spree in September 2015. He was taken to the hospital complaining of headaches, hallucinations, and an erection for five days. A month after Meredith was rushed to the hospital, basketball player Lamar Odom, 36 year old, was found in a coma in the Love Ranch brothel located outside Las Vegas. Odom, recently divorced from Khloe Kardashian, had spent three days at a brothel taking cocaine and an estimated 10 doses of so-called herbal Viagra. Odom took a supplement called Reload. The FDA had issued a warning about it that it contains Sidenafil as an undeclared ingredient in June 2013, but had not issued an official recall. Herbal Viagra is a generic term for products marketed excuse me, as natural supplements that promise to increase sexual enhancement. Sexual enhancement is different from a cure for erectile dysfunction, which is a medical condition, and it is sold over the counter, gas stations, department stores, food stores, and other outlets. While many of these drugs are safe for consumption, others may contain unregulated versions of the drugs that require prescription. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end right there. And just basically, the article ends with consumers are advised to consult with their health care professor before taking these supplement. So that's an article that will be coming out in Men's Health next year. And again, it just exposes some dangers of the internet and um, particularly the rise uh, of, of, of Viagra. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Nick. Uh, Nicholas Forgioni, I'm not a member of the Pirate Party. I have worked with a Pirate Party campaign, however. Um, I know one of the purposes of these conventions is to grow the party and expand the party's appeal. Uh, I think part of doing that could involve expanding the platform um, and, all, and in a way that would differentiate from other parties. Um, and it, a big issue for me is conservation, both of habitat and of different species. Um, and, and one way to expand the Pirate Party's platform to include uh, environmentalism and conservation in a way that would be consistent with the Pirate Party's foundation of openness um, would, um, as I see it, would be to deregulate what people can keep uh, to varying degrees. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually looked up state or federal laws about what 
um, what sorts of animals can be kept, but the laws are inconsistent and often don't make a lot of sense. Uh, right now, if I messed around with PayPal a little bit, I could order a ringed octopus. A ringed octopus could actually kill a full-grown human being. Um, it also takes a significant amount of infrastructure to keep one. Um, I could order one right now. I would have that animal inside of a week and it would be dead. That's why I don't order one. I tend to think that most people can be trusted to, to make that decision. Plenty of people don't buy cats or dogs because they cannot care for them. Other people can care for them and do purchase those animals do and care for them uh, very well. Um, so I'm arguing that um, something the par party may consider is including an environmental component that would push for the right to for private citizens to be able to keep more animals than they currently can, either at a state or a federal level. Um, surprising amount of variation between states. Uh, just a few miles south of here in Rhode Island, you would have more options than you would in Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And, and expanding that would allow for more education, more information about certain species. Uh, it would increase the appeal of certain species, which would make conservation efforts across the country or overseas more viable. Um, it, would also, it would also create um, more opportunities for captive breeding. Uh, just this week, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the vaquita. It was a, a sort of dolphin. It lived in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that animal is in all likelihood extinct as of this week. There was talk of captive breeding. It did not happen. And that is one more species that went extinct. Um, and I, I mean, literally, that is just this week. You can Google it. If they're not extinct, they are in the low double, if not single digits. Um, and, and also having a captive population, having the captive population would be a backup. Um, and that's something I think that could be marketable to a lot of voters. Uh, there is actually cross-party support for the environment, a surprising amount of it. And, and I believe doing it this way would be consistent with some of the Pirate Party's more marketable points of openness and deregulation. Thank you.